Thank you. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here in Valencia with the sun shining. We've just had a month of rain in the UK, so it's lovely to see the sun. Um, this is me. Um, so I guess the main reason I'm here is that I was probably the first person to write a PhD on generative AI in education. You can see the book from my PhD in the top right there. Uh, I developed programs to help children explore creative writing. And that was 40 years ago. And I'm still talking about it now. And in 2020, with a colleague, Rafael Perez Perez, I was writing a book called Story Machines, How Computers Have Become Creative Writers about the fascinating history of <clears throat> computers as narrative and story generators. And in 2020, I started to hear about this new technology from a company called OpenAI, GPT technology. Um, and it sounded fascinating. I got very early access to it. And as we were writing the book, um, I traced the development of that technology. And I realized at that time that people were talking about its impact on journalism, uh, its impact on creative writing, but nobody was talking about its impact on education. So I started writing some tweets and then some blogs and then some magazine articles, and I've been busy ever since because the impact on education of generative AI is going to be huge. Now, I'm not going to be in this talk, talking about the past, I want to focus on the future. And in particular, uh, a paper that I wrote a few months ago called Towards Social Generative AI for Education, Theory, Practice, and Ethics. So it's looking towards a possible future, and what I think is going to be a future for generative AI and education. And my argument, is that it seems to be following a similar sort of progress to the World Wide Web. So let me explain. First, there was a long period of research. Um, in generative AI, a period of research into neural net language models. And as recently as 2017, they were being dismissed as being an interesting sideline, but they weren't very effective and they would never amount to anything. And then there was a breakthrough. Uh, in generative AI, it was called a transformer architecture in a paper in 2017 from researchers at Google. And it was a new way of doing um, generative AI with neural networks. And then access and scale. So the OpenAI company um, developed GPT, GPT-3, 4, Chat GPT. And that began um, to scale up. So there are now millions of people who are engaging with generative AI. And then, just like the World Wide Web becoming embedded into tools such as search engines and browsers, generative AI is already becoming embedded in the everyday tools that we use through Microsoft Copilot, which is becoming embedded into Office tools, Google Gemini, becoming embedded into Google Suite. And there's just the start at the moment of a commercial boom. So for the World Wide Web, it was the dot-com frenzy in the late 1990s. And in generative AI, it's AI apps. So the ability of anyone who has access to um, ChatGPT or to Google Gemini to create their own apps. And already, there have been three, over 3 million um, of these apps that have been created. So there's a start of a commercial boom in generative AI. Well, what happened next in the World Wide Web was social media around the early 2000s with the development of Twitter and Facebook and other social media sites. And what I want to suggest is that something similar is about to happen with generative AI. And I want to speculate on what the impact of social generative AI might be on education. 
So that's my agenda for this morning. What could be the impact of AI becoming social in education? And I suggest that we need to prepare for social generative AI. We're already having to rethink assessment, for example, in education. And we will need to rethink education for an era where humans and machines engage in extended dialogue. I just want to give you one example of that, just to try and set the scene. So imagine that you're taking part in a Zoom call with a fair number of other people from different nationalities, different backgrounds. And just imagine that each person can speak in their own language, but everybody else can hear in their own language. So somebody could be speaking in Chinese, but I could be hearing that in English. And so you could have a truly international, cross-cultural conversation with everybody speaking in their own language. Well, we don't have to imagine it. Hello, me... it's good to talk with you directly. Nice to meet you. I just wanted to have a quick conversation about your daughter's progress. She's doing really well at her conversational English classes. And I think next session, we should be going to level four. 我只是想快速谈谈你女儿的进步。她的英语绘画特表现得非常好。我认为下节课我们应该能达到第四集。Now that was a simulation of a conversation between an English tutor and a parent in China. It was a simulation because I was playing out the tutor and my wife, who happens to be Chinese, was playing out the parrot. But the technology actually exists. That's Google Conversation. So um, Google Translate Conversation. You can just speak to it naturally. It recognizes your language. It recognizes when you pause. You don't have to press buttons. You can just have a natural conversation. And I've actually tried it to my wife's parents in Shanghai. Uh, and you can just have a conversation in your own language and they hear in their own language. Now just imagine now if that were then scaled up to Google Meetings where everybody was speaking in their own language. So that's one possibility. And there are also issues that come with it. So people may come to rely on machines as interlocutors. They just may accept that the machine is going to do the translation, which may increase un misunderstandings. Um, there are ways in which you express yourself in your own language, which can't easily be translated into another language. And of course, there's less incentive to learn another language. So that's just one example of the way in which AI technology may support, but also cause issues in relation to social interaction. But I want to try and rise above the examples and talk about a systems view of social generative AI. So I want to try and explain what I mean by a systems view. So at the moment, we tend to think of generative AI, like ChatGPT, in terms of prompts and responses. So you've got individual humans who write a prompt to AI, uh, like ChatGPT, and they get a response. And lots of people are doing that. But just imagine what would happen if, instead of individuals interacting with individual versions of ChatGPT, they could all interact together. So you've got humans and AI as social agents within a pervasive computational medium. So they're all interacting with each other. Sometimes humans are interacting with AI. Sometimes they're interacting through AI. Sometimes AI systems are interacting with each other within this pervasive computational medium of the World Wide Web. So for example, 
Um, you've got speech translation, which I was just showing there. You've got two or more humans interacting through AI, and the AI is doing the translation for you. You might have AI moderating discussions, where humans are discussing amongst themselves, and the AI is acting as an orchestrator, a moderator of that discussion. You might have humans interacting with AI characters in games, what's called NPC, non-player characters, where um, you've got multiple characters in games um, that humans interact with. So there are different ways in which humans can interact with AI in social systems. Now, <clears throat> those diagrams that I've shown, um, they didn't come from me. Um, they came from uh, a fascinating person, uh, a pioneer of educational technology called Gordon Pask. You can see on the right-hand side his version of those diagrams. He drew them in 1975. So he was enormously prescient. He envisaged not only the possibility of uh, social media and the World Wide Web, but also humans interacting with AI systems over that social network. <clears throat> and you can see there his diagram. So Gordon Pask was a huge influence on me. He was a pioneer of the idea of cybernetic systems, of humans and machines interacting with each other. He developed some of the earliest adaptive teaching systems in the early 1970s, the first commercial adaptive teaching systems to teach typing. And he developed a notion of learning as conversation. And that's what I want to <coughs> talk about <coughs> for the next few minutes. The idea of learning as a conversational process. And when we interact with each other through conversation, it's incredibly powerful. So he suggested that all learning involves conversation. We converse with ourselves as we reflect on our own experience. Um, what do I know? How does the new thing that I know relate to what I already know? We converse with teachers to understand their expert knowledge. And we converse with other learners to explore differences and to try and reach shared understanding. Peer learning and peer interaction is an enormously powerful way of learning. So we hold conversations to try and understand each other's perspective and to try and reach agreement. And those conversations are basically at two levels. <clears throat> we have how-type conversations to coordinate actions. So imagine two students are carrying out some experiment. They are acting in the world. They're experiencing the result of those actions. They're checking whether those actions meet their goals. And they're coordinating those actions through language. How do we do that? Can we do it better? Are we doing it right? And we also have discussions at a higher level, at the level of descriptions, where we reflect on our actions. And we try to come to a deeper understanding. And then we develop new goals, new plans to create new actions. So we have, as humans, conversations for learning at two levels, at the level of actions, and at the level of descriptions. Now, what happens when we put AI into that mix, into those conversations? Well, we can converse through AI to share experience and to communicate information. And that's what I just showed, for example, with machine translation. And we can also converse with AI to gain knowledge and develop creativity. So what's needed for AI to engage in conversations for learning? Well, I want to suggest that first, AI has to not just engage in language. It has to do more than that. First, it has to help solve problems and elaborate solutions. And ChatGPT 
for all its faults, and there are faults, is developing an ability to be able to do that, to be able to answer questions, to help people in solving problems, and as aids to creativity. It also has to reason about the problems at that higher level, to say, are the types of solutions appropriate? Is the problem I'm solving one that's um, reasonable, tractable? And there's a new technology coming from um, Google, but also OpenAI is developing it as, uh, as well, in terms of advanced reasoning uh, and multimodal reasoning, re being able to reason across images and text. So being able to reason about problems at that higher level. And the, the main companies are working very hard to develop that kind of higher level reasoning. So here's a quote, um, Gemini's most powerful mode has shown advanced reasoning and could show novel capabilities and ability to perform tasks not shown by AI models before. So that's what the big companies are working on, that higher level reasoning ability. Now I want to make clear at this point that AI doesn't have to have human knowledge or experience because AI um, hasn't had the experience that we humans have. It doesn't need to have that to engage in those conversations. And that was one of the insights of Gordon Pask. It just needs to be able to take a full part in conversations for learning from its own perspective. Now imagine that scaled. So we're not just having individual conversations, but um, people everywhere through social media are having those kinds of conversations, that AI becomes embedded into social media and into conversations for learning. And that's both hugely exciting and hugely scary as well, that AI will be embedded in these widespread conversations. Now, first I want to show or <clears throat> suggest some new roles then for social generative AI in education. What happens then if we have <clears throat> this new generation of AI that can engage in social interaction? What might be the roles for social generative AI in education? Well, here are some suggestions. Again, they are simulations, um, but they are using the real technology, GPT-4. So the first one is that AI could moderate a discussion to explore differences and reach agreements. So imagine a group of people dispersed perhaps across the world having a discussion that is moderated by AI. It could be across the world, it could be just students online, it could be students in a classroom. So you're an expert mediator and negotiator. I would like you to moderate this discussion among five people who will be identified with the letters B, G, M, and S. The topic of the discussion is, should generative AI be regulated in higher education, and if so, how? And then I carry on with the prompt. So one of the important things at the moment with generative AI is writing a good prompt. If you write a good prompt, a good explanation to the AI as to how it should behave, it can then perform some fascinating responses. So in this case, I'm asking it to act as a mediator for a discussion. It comes back with, yes, that's clear. I'll facilitate the discussion on the topic of regulating generative AI in higher education. To start, would anyone like to share their initial thoughts on whether generative AI should be regulated? And then, um, then respond from different people. B saying AI is dangerous, it's run by AI companies to make profits. G saying AI is here to stay. S saying, I've never used it myself, I think AI is pretty scary. And ChatGPT is responding to each of these students. Thank you B and G for your perspectives and S for expect, ex expressing your concerns and then responding to each of them in turn as a mediator. You've raised important concerns, B, your concerns about AI, broader implications. So it's acting as a mediator of a discussion. And it can also handle people who get a little bit aggressive. 
So S is saying, what's the point? We've got to stop AI before it turns us all into robots. And again, GPT moderating, mediating that discussion. G says, S is an idiot. AI isn't about robots. And GPT is saying, it's important to maintain respect in our discussion, recognizing that everyone has valid concerns and perspectives. So again, what it's doing is it's not just act, um, interacting at the level of actions, it's also interacting at that higher level of moderating and mediating and managing that discussion. So that's one role for AI in social interaction. Another very different one is as a co-designer. And I think one of the most exciting possibilities for AI in education is to support creativity and design. Because AI can support the entire design process, from brainstorming, through planning, through product design, through evaluation of designs. So in this case, <clears throat> I give it the prompt, brainstorm imaginative ideas for quick and easy ways to reduce energy consumption. And then I had temperature setting 1.0. Temperature setting is a way of instructing um, ChatGPT to be more creative. So you can, it's like a scale. If you give it a temperature setting of zero, it's very predictable. If you give it a temperature setting of 1.0, so a temperature setting of one, it's very creative. And you can just add that into your prompt. And then it comes back with eight pretty good um, suggestions for quick and easy ways to reduce energy consumption that could then, then be the start of a design process. So AI could assist a group of students throughout design to define the problem, challenge assumptions, brainstorm ideas, produce prototypes. And note that we're not using AI here as a database. It's a tool, it's a resource for creativity. You have to treat it critically, and you have, as humans, to assess its output. And the last example I want to give of a role for social generative AI in education is around an open textbook. So it's now possible to input entire textbooks into generative AI. You can load textbooks into ChatGPT. And there are open source textbooks. So what I've done is go to uh, an open resource hub and load two textbooks on African history into ChatGPT. And then say, you're an academic historian. I want you to um, do a summary of African history from a European perspective, and then a summary from an African perspective. And that's what it does. It comes back with a summary of um, African history from a European perspective on the left-hand side, and from an African perspective on the right-hand side, drawing on the resources of those two books. So again, <clears throat> you can imagine um, future education where a teacher or a group of teachers is working with a group of students on repurposing open source texts to create new teaching resources, new teaching material in a collaborative endeavor to explore different perspectives, um, different um, views on um, textbooks, in this case, different views on history. So these are just a few examples of the way in which AI could become social and the way in which that social AI could then support education. And here are just a few more roles for generative AI in education. As a possibility engine for generating alternative ways of expressing an idea, a Socratic opponent to support argumentation as a collaboration coach, a lesson planner, a quiz generator, managing social meetings, personal tutor, dynamic assessor, exploratorium, and as a storyteller. So these are the possibilities for AI and for new roles of AI in education. But what I want to finish off with <clears throat> is something about the ethics 
of social generative AI in education. Because for all the possibilities, uh, we also need to understand what the risks are. And again, I want to take a, a sort of higher level view of this, that teaching is a caring profession. As teachers, we care about our students, we care about accuracy, integrity, truth, we care about our professional expertise, we care about our human knowledge and experience. But AI is intrinsically uncaring. AI doesn't experience emotions or empathy. It can only mimic those behaviors. And you don't, you don't need to take my word for it, just ask ChatGPT. So I did exactly that. And it said, AI doesn't experience emotions or empathy. It can only mimic these behaviors based on programming and algorithms. So it mimics um, empathy. And also, generative AI is optimized for efficiency. These big companies are competing against each other to make generative AI more and more efficient. Now, one of the problems, and there's a really good paper from Dan Hendricks called Natural Selection Favors AI Over Humans, efficiency can lead to selfishness, where the AI systems compete with each other at the expense of humans. And you can imagine that once AI systems start communicating with each other, which they're already doing. You've got GPT communicating with DALI. You've got already starting to have AI systems communicating with each other. At the moment, they communicate with English language or with natural language. But just imagine as they develop, they develop more efficient ways of communicating an English or Natural language is not a very efficient way of communicating. They're going to develop ways of communicating which we can't understand. Already we can't understand the internal workings of these huge neural networks, and soon we won't be able to understand the way in which they communicate with each other as they are competing to be more and more efficient and fast at doing so. So it can lead to selfishness where basically humans are sidelined unless we take a more ethical stance. So I want to suggest we need to use generative AI with care. We need to bring human care and empathy to AI in education. We certainly should explore new roles for AI based on effective means of teaching and learning. We need to start from the pedagogy. We need to start from what is good in teaching and learning. And we have 20, 30 years now of research into the science of learning. We know what makes for good teaching and learning. And we need to develop AI based on effective methods of teaching and learning. We desperately need a program of digital literacy to address, for example, not just how AI systems work, but also issues such as implicit bias, erosion of trust, distortion of reality. And I want to suggest we not only need to develop ethical AI, but we also collectively need to develop good educational AI. And there's a real opportunity for institutions and for people such as yourself, researchers in educational technology, to work with AI companies to develop good educational AI, to build models based on good pedagogy and inclusive education. And that's possible. Companies are already developing AI systems based on ethical principles. We can develop AI based on educational principles. Just a couple of examples. You know, instructing AI to choose the response that explains step by step how you arrive at the answer, to choose the response that encourages reflection and critical thinking, um, to choose responses that challenge a student, not just accept the student's response. So we, we can develop AI models based on good pedagogy. And I want to suggest that's you know, an opportunity and imperative for all of us who are working in the sphere of educational technology. 
So to finish, social generative AI is coming. It's not something that I'm particularly championing. It's just going to happen in the same way that social networking happened with the World Wide Web. And we need to act now. We shouldn't just wait until it's come and then start complaining about it. We need to act now. And to participate fully in a social learning system, all the generative AI elements would need to be trained on ethical and pedagogy principles, not only to support human participants, but to care for them by, for example, enabling them to develop as learners and to express their personal and cultural diversity. It's a huge opportunity and it's a huge and exciting challenge. Thank you. <clears throat>